We'll go now to our next item, which is uh, information technology services. I believe Mr. Dietz is here. There he is. And I've already yes, lost track of him. Here. This is 10 minutes for your budget, I think. Or 15, uh, I believe it's 15. 15, 15, 15 minutes, right. okay. 15 minutes. Uh, the clock will start when you begin talking. Please go ahead. I need to share my screen here in just one moment. I am not able to share at this time. Um, what's going on? Can we? Um, there's get... a, a setting here that I need to change. I'm sorry about that. Oh, OK. If there's somebody from the mayor's office with access to this, we could. Mr. Krebs, can you uh, assist us here? Uh, Rick, are you are you talking about someone that can help you present this your screen? Yeah, uh, I believe Elizabeth has access to your slides. Yes, that's correct. Could she put them up? Barring that, I believe I have them up. I could perhaps uh, present them. Just one second. I think I have my share screen going. Can you go. see that? I think I've yes. gotten the screen share on. Yes, we can see it. Okay. Rick, just you let me know when you want me to move your slides. Um, I am shifting over to mine now. Sorry about that. Are you able to see mine? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Is that okay. showing for all of you? Yes. All right. Thanks for yes, your patience, yes. Mr. Chair, Council Members. Sorry about that. All right. Here we go. Um, Hello, I am Rick Dietz, Director of the City's Information and Technology Services Department, more succinctly known as ITS. I appreciate the opportunity to present the 2022 ITS budget proposal for your consideration. In ITS, our mission is to provide the IT services, tools, training, and resources necessary to maintain mission-critical city systems, empower city staff to excel in their work, and to improve digital equity in our community electronically engage our residents in their own governance. Ultimately, our work in ITS is as much about people as it is about technology. So I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and commend ITS staff for their continuing hard work and excellence supporting our public staff, uh, public and staff customers, especially over the past year, as we've all adapted to COVID's personal and operational challenges. ITS provides broad information technology and communications technology support for all city departments. In the next few slides, I'll highlight the status of some of our 2021 goals currently underway. Here are some highlights. We restructured the department at the beginning of 2021 into operations and applications divisions. That transition is ongoing. Improving broadband with a high priority um, is a high priority for the city and for the ITS department. And we've made bringing uh, the digital divide, the, uh, bridging the digital divide, the focus of our broadband efforts in 2021. 
And we've put the city's digital equity strategic plan into action in 2021 with digital equity grants and planned Wi-Fi deployments. In 2022, we've deployed our new help desk platform and we've managed uh, and are managing dozens of software evaluation and deployment, hardware replacement, IT infrastructure and digital services projects. We're continuing working to improve our information resources, including our website and open data portal, be clear. We've released our new data portal and visualization platform, Socrata, including COVID and climate action dashboards and are enhancing our online GIS maps. We're deploying enterprise community development software, a comprehensive toolkit for plan review, permits, inspections, and more with planning, hand, and other departments. Additional work is progressing on the expansion of document management, GIS migration, revenue collection integrations, and digital services updates. In the past, uh, in the past year to date, we've averaged 4.8 uh, out of, excuse me, 4.8 out of five. Get back to the right slide. 4.8 out of five uh, rating in our in our customer service support surveys, and we've deployed our new Manage Engine Help Desk system. Our annual computer capital replacement cycle is underway, replacing roughly a quarter of our capital inventory of computers, monitors, printers, and peripherals. We work hard to provide highly uh, available, uh, redundant, and secure uh, systems. Our, uh, sorry, wrong slide again. Our, uh, our year-to-date uptime for our core virtual server file storage system and network is over 9.9%. Uh, in addition, we've provided systems administration and network engineering services for city facilities. There's a lot more we've been up to in 2021, but those are some of the highlights. Next, I'd like to share the big themes of our 2022 budget. One is to protect and preserve the basic functions of city government. It's no secret that if IT systems don't work, then the city doesn't work. Networks, phones, Virtual file servers, file storage backup, et cetera, require resources to keep running and up to date. Telecom fund revenue continues to decline. To, to address this, we're moving CATS, community access television services funding, and other expenses into the general fund in 2022. We can't delay this uh, any longer. We, in addition, we've deferred capital investments in IT infrastructure, in particular network and phones, as long as we can. And this budget also addresses that. Plan your work, then work your plan. That's one thing that we say in ITS. Planning is a big part of what we do, whether it's IT, uh, ITS organizational review, strategic plan, capital plan, or digital equity strategic plan. We've developed solid plans, and now is our time to execute on them. On infrastructure, we need to replace our aging and out of support network gear, replace our antiquated phone system, and expand our virtual server and file storage systems. Equity inclusion is all the more critical with the continuing at impacts of the pandemic. We need to extend the promise of technology to all of our residents. And our digital equity strategic plan provides a blueprint for our digital equity grants, strategic Wi-Fi investments, and more. Cybersecurity has always been critical, but we're stepping up in 2022 with our network upgrade, new threat monitoring and mitigation systems, and enhanced staff training. We're constantly working to improve efficiency and sustainability through process improvement, paper reduction, and document management and scanning. These are our touchstones in 2022. Now let's explore our 2022 goals. In 2022, we'll be updating IT policies and procedures with special attention to cybersecurity, disaster recovery, and physical IT security. We will build on our broadband uh, work and implement digital e equity strategic plan recommendations, including 2022 digital equity grants and public Wi-Fi projects. In 2022, we'll complete data migration into our new data portal platform and expand dashboards and visualization. 
We'll be conducting needs analysis and planning around smart city systems and video service needs and engage with HR on process improvement for staff onboarding. In 2022, we will continue to support our website and expand the data we make available to staff and the public through our Be Clear data portal. We will build new document management workflows and digitize paper documents. We will upgrade our GIS system and expand our portfolio of interactive web maps and mobile data collection tools We'll create new value-added uh, data sets for staff from the state's the state of Indiana's new aerial photography captured this year. We will upgrade and replace a significant portion of our wired and wireless network equipment, which is aging and out of vendor support. And we'll expand our virtual server infrastructure and begin to update our phone system to a voice over IP platform all the while maintaining high standards for availability and reliability of our critical IT infrastructure and core digital services. And our 2022 customer service goal is a 4.7 out of 5 excellent rating. Each year we're replacing hardware across the organization and we will work to reduce our susceptibility to social engineering cyber attacks through training and education of city staff. This covers our 2022 uh, goal highlights. Now let's turn to our actual budget. ITS budgets from several funds, the ITS general fund, the telecommunications non-reverting fund, uh, electronic map uh, fund and enhanced access fund. Of note, the telecommunications non-reverting fund draws its revenue from the franchise fees paid by state video franchisees operating in Bloomington. This fund is in decline as cord cutting and a shift from traditional cable TV continues. And over the past few years, we've moved many ITS expenses to the general fund. In the 2022 budget, 455,000 in CATS, Community Access Television Services, funding moves to the ITS general fund. And telecom fund revenue and fund reserves are no longer sufficient to host this expense. There are a few other transfers like this, but CATS is the most significant. With that noted, We'll now, um, I'll now take a look at our various budget lines. Several have notable changes that I want to bring to your attention. The ITS uh, department's general fund budget request is $4,500,000, uh, $532,652. In personnel, uh, personnel services, you know, our request is $1,941,519, which is an increase of 5%. And this is due to the increases in uh, salary and uh, bonuses mentioned uh, earlier. In uh, management fees, consultants, and workshops, we have an increase 173,000. Every four to five years, the state uh, contracts for aerial flyovers to provide new uh, orthophotography data maps. In order to fully utilize these data, we contract with GIS consulting services to convert the data for the city, city departments to use to provide edge of pavement, building area, parking area, and contour elevation data. Planning around smart city technologies and video service needs uh, is also part of this, but GIS is the most uh, substan substantial, and these are one-time uh, expenses. In uh, other lines, our telephone, and it is an increase of 98,000 uh, uh, in total uh, to cover uh, transition to voice over IP phone system. In hardware and software maintenance, we have an increase of 24,900, largely for cybersecurity uh, investments, uh, including new uh, antivirus um, and new anti-malware systems. In dues and subscriptions, we have an increase of 123,700 due to increased licensing costs for Google Enterprise, uh, Zoom, and uh, no before cybersecurity trainings. In grants, we have a request for 50,000 for the 2022 digital equity grants funding. This uh, was a, a recover forward expense that we're now uh, requesting to move into our regular ITS uh, budget. Uh, in line, uh, the community access and TV and radio, we have a request for 455. Uh, 1,807 for community access television services. This is a 1% increase from 2021. This expense was moved from the telecom fund into the uh, general fund. 
uh, in capital outlays, purchase of equipment, we have an increase of 940,720. For major capital investments, which include the enterprise network, hardware upgrade, Wi-Fi upgrades, uh, security camera storage, uh, virtual server infrastructure, data center uh, power supplies, and more. These are significant one-time infrastructure uh, investments, uh, and they are, but they are also offset by Recover Forward and CARES funds. Onto the telecommunications non-reverting fund. The uh, budget request is 387,000 uh, for uh, the overall telecommunications non-reverting fund with notable uh, expenses, including an equipment, an increase of $16,468 uh, for a regular annual capital replacement of PCs, laptops, uh, and other uh, peripherals. We, um, excuse me, in uh, the services account of telecommunications, we have a communications contract increase of 5,000 uh, in terms of what we use to host uh, the uh, uh, internet and phone service for the uh, fire station relocation. And then also included here is the community access uh, TV reduction that corresponds to the increase in the, the general fund. Sorry. I've got it. There we go, sorry, a delay. Um, the electronic map generation fund and app ac enhanced access funds have uh, no appropriations requested in 2022. Uh, Recover Forward continues in 2022 with the American Rescue Plan uh, ARPA funding in, additional in addition to CARES resources to support critical IT infrastructure investments and continuing COVID-19 response. These Recover Forward funds offset the one-time expenses in the 2022 ITS general fund budget. In 2022, Recover Forward funds will be used to support major capital investments in critical areas. These one-time investments will have a long-term impact on city operations and on the ITS department services to city staff and the public. The overall 2022 uh, ITS budget is $4,920,000. Uh, $100, an increase of $1,375,609, which is offset by $575,000 in ARPA Recover Forward Phase 3 funding and by $1,000,000 in uh, City CARES funding. In conclusion, the 2022 Information and Technology Services budget request reflects the following priorities keeping critical infrastructure, and thus the city running, addressing financial challenges, on, uh, putting our plans to work, extending the promise of modern technology as widely as possible, securing our infrastructure and staff from online attack, doubling down on process improvements. So thank you for your consideration of the ITS budget, and I'd be happy, happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deeds. If you'd please unshare the screen. Sure thing. Or whoever's running the slide would. I've I've got it here. Just one second. All right. Are there questions for the ITS budget? I'll start with uh, President Sims. Three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dietz, for your presentation. Um, I do have a question. Obviously, um, uh, one of the things I'll discuss is the $50,000 for the digital equity grants funding, um, but I'm just putting it up there to kind of frame what I'm going to ask. Um, to improve digital equity in our community, um, what, do, what does that mean and how are we doing? And... <coughs> Pardon me. I think, um, well, just with that, just what I said, how, how does that work? 
digital equity looks different in, in different communities. In uh, Bloomington, we, uh, we are certainly better uh, off than in communities where there is no connectivity. But as our digital equity strategic plan and the survey we conducted uh, at the very end of, of 2010, uh, and then the strategic plan that, that um, emerged, uh, emerged from that tells us we do have gaps. We have gaps uh, in um, access uh, to coverage, in uh, ability to, to fully utilize uh, the, the internet, to be able to afford internet services. The, there's an, a number of items that uh, are called out that we can take action on. I think a few of the more salient things that emerged was that e even though uh, our local providers do have subsidy programs, almost none of the eligible individuals um, or families in our community even know that those subsidy programs exist. So there's gra gaps, information gaps that we can work, uh, we can work to, to fulfill. Uh, another element that we have discussed recently is the deployment of uh, some amount of public Wi-Fi in and around uh, air strategic areas in our communities where that could be uh, beneficial and provide an additional you know, avenue for, for internet access. And uh, the, the council was fully in support of that. We intend to, to extend that even further in, in 2022. You mean extend it further than what we have already with city parks? So it's going to be Correct. farther extended. Correct. Yes, farther. additional okay. appropriation for, for additional coverage, yes. Okay, thank you. And that $50,000 in those grant requests, how do we use that? Is that to fill those gaps with other companies? Um, you know, those, are, um, those are targeting local not-for-profits who as part of their mission are, are challenged um, and, and they're, uh, they're are challenged by uh, digital equity and have initiatives that they can use to support their customers. Um, thank you, I think my time is up. Yeah. <clears throat> you're, you're muted, Chair. I'm muted. My bad. Yes. Council Member Scambolari, three minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation, Mr. Deeds. Couple questions. Um, how much do we pay for the no before? What's that line item? Um, I am Ballpark. not certain right now. Um, is it a hundred dollars? Is it five hundred thousand dollars? I mean, just ballpark. Oh no, no. Um, it's it's currently less than ten. Okay. Thank you. Um. All right, and let me figure out how to ask this question. You talked about the customer satisfaction surveys that you run through HR, and those, I, I assume, if I'm understanding correctly, are directed at your internal customers, correct? So department people, city employees, and so forth. Is that correct? We have multiple uh, customer service surveys. Some of them, uh, or one avenue for that is uh, through our help desk whenever a, uh, a support item is you know, reported and when it's closed out, there's a, a survey that the individual you know, receives to indicate their satisfaction with their services. Uh, at the end of each year, we do uh, a citywide in, you know, internal city staff survey that goes out to everyone in the uh, organization that looks at you know, broader issues of IT support, not just did, did we fix this issue in a timely fashion, you know, et cetera. So we have a number of tools that we use to, um, to, to gauge uh, okay. our customer satisfaction, yes. So let me ask a very specific question then. How do we gather external feedback? Not from city employees, not from city staff. How do we gather external feedback on our website? That's the gateway through which most mm -hmm. people access information about the city. How do we gather external feedback on that? Um, you know, in the past, we have delivered uh, surveys, you know, web-based surveys. We have done 
um, kind of tabling at the you know farmers market, but this was generally in the context of uh, you know website uh, website revisions. And you've said you've done these things in the past. What is there anything we're doing now in particular? Um, you know, we're looking at making some modifications to the website in partnership with the uh, with the mayor's office. We've had some conversations with council members as well who are interested in, in you know the website. So uh, we're, we're uh, beginning a process of looking at some of those those features and in improvements that would be um, uh, be of interest. Okay, and I'll come back for a second round. So thanks. Councilmember Volan, you're muted. Forgetting, I'm sorry. Further questions, first round for ITS. <laughs> Councilmember Smith, three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Dietz, for the presentation. Uh, I think uh, what, what strikes me is a um, 39% increase, increase in your budget. That, that kind of alarms me. Um, so why do we need to do that? Um, over one year, um, is there some rationale in that? Yeah, um, the main issues are we have a substantial network upgrade, which um, we can execute in a single year, and we'd like to, as opposed to to you know dragging it out. And with um, the the unique resources that we have this year, we would be able to move or in 2022, we would be able to move forward with that. Um, you know, you, you've probably heard stories, uh, you know, from other uh, departments. You know, one, you know, dynamic uh, involved here is that of, you know, th this is a substantial capital, uh, capital replacement, a capital purchase. Um, it's, it's been deferred uh, for, for quite some time. And it's something that we simply need to do. In an ideal world, this would be amortized a little bit over several previous several. years. Um, you know, but uh, you know, we haven't we haven't really found that to be you know affordable in previous years. Again, with the unique resources that we have now, we are able to. And then um, and then we're committed to getting this on a, a more regular capital replacement schedule um, spread out over a number of years so that uh, we don't have a large uh, lump sum as well. Yeah, that, that touches right. on the network issue, but then there's also, uh, you know, our, our, our phone system is, is quite antiquated. We're wanting to, you know, replace that. We have uh, a number of cybersecurity investments that we think are very important um, to make this coming year. So there's a number of things that add to that increase uh, increase this year. Let me ask you one brief follow-up question on that is after, after this uh, replacement of the technology happens, does that, do you envision that then the budget would um, go back to about 3.3 million a year? Uh, yeah, uh, almost all of the increases that you're seeing uh, in our budget in this year are one-time increases the the vast majority of which are covered by the um the arpa and cares funds thank you mr deets thank you mr smith further questions from members first round councilmember piedmont smith have you already asked a question yet for its i don't believe so okay please go ahead three minutes um i wanted to have more information about one of the goals in your um memo, Mr. Dietz. Uh, it says evaluate vendors to develop a smart city strategic plan. Um, could you please describe what that is? Yeah, Why a smart it might cities, be beneficial? Yeah, a smart city strategic plan is looking at a number of different uh, new and novel uh, technologies and how they might aid uh, city operations and IT operations. Generally, they're lumped into you know, the use of uh, kind of sensors, you know, smart, uh, you know, smart sensors, 
um, you know, additional like data, uh, data processing, um, and, and some of the examples of, of those technologies that have been implemented, you know, are uh, kind of smart approaches to parking and parking management that might, um, you know, have a better idea of, um, you know, how many, uh, how many spaces are free, uh, more intelligent um, organization of, of uh, traffic light patterns. Um, yeah, there, there, there's a number of different, um, uh, different potential uh, projects that result from this. And, you know, this is an area of, of high interest amongst, uh, you know, amongst progressive cities. So we're looking um, to, to see if there's a fit for some of these uh, types of concepts with, within our IT operation. And how much money uh, is going towards studying these options next year? Um, I'll have to take a, a look that, that is in with the larger GIS, um, uh, GIS expense around uh, the state, state of Indiana's aerial photography, but I suspect it's um, probably no more than 25 or 30,000 allocated to, to that. Okay, and then I have another uh, unrelated question. Um, the, uh, the $500 bonuses, don't come from the general fund, right? You mentioned them when you talked about your personnel expenses, but that's ARPA money, right? And that we talked about with HR. Yeah, that 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 sounds correct. I, I may have misspoke on that. Mr. Underwood, is that right? Is he still here? Correct. Uh, that, that bonuses are in HR, uh, the 500 that Rick has is for uh, IT equipment. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions first round for ITS? I've got a couple. Uh, give me three minutes, please. Uh, Mr. Dietz, um, what is the status of the U Report app? Is it still an app? I can't find it in the app store. Can it be used through an app? The uh, the U Report system is a hybrid web service. It's usable in a browser or in a mobile device through um, uh, a mobile website. You can essentially uh, set up a mobile website as an app in your uh, you know, in your Apple or Android device as you wish, but all uh, all of the functionality of the U Report system is accessible through a web web interface, including uh, a mobile web interface. But I mean, uh, can it not be set up so that uh, people don't have to think about setting up? Uh, I mean, just they can download an app like they download thousands of other apps. Uh, that, I mean, that would require us to transform that into um, a separate app and manage that in the various app stores. What we saw a number of uh, a number of cities doing is migrating away from having a lot of custom uh, apps that are platform specific to deploying deploying tools that are uh, essentially mobile web applications, and thus will work on any any platform with a, uh, with a web browser. How, um, how do you promote the existence of your report? Uh, through a number of different uh, channels, for instance, um, uh, neighborhood uh, packets, you know, promotions from uh, the mayor's office to new employees, any, through our uh, website, um, if, if you do you know, a search about reporting issues, it pulls up the U report, uh, U report site and that will function you know, equally well in a, um, a desktop as well as a, a mobile device. Okay, thank you. I'll, I have another question, but I'll wait for the second round. Are there any second round questions from members of, to the ITS budget? Council Riscambillary, three minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Dietz, I want to come back to this idea of including external feedback too. Most of us work pretty hard to stay in touch with our constituents 
and to make local government as accessible as we possibly can to them. The website's obviously a big part of that. Um, it sounds like we've done some things kind of here and there in the past. What could we do in the future that is more systemic? To tabling is kind of random and catch as catch can. Um, I, you didn't share much about the survey, but that would be interesting. But has the office given any consideration to gathering external feedback on some of our outward facing tools? Yes, and uh, you know we we actually have within you know you report a you know report to provide us information um, to that that's a little bit uh, a little bit circular, but that's one you know avenue that we get a lot of uh, feedback on. Now, to to your uh, point, you know we're just at the very beginning stages of uh, discussing some of these changes that we're hoping to make to the website. It's largely been uh, been driven by a need to uh, migrate our uh, content manager to the updated, its updated version. Uh, but in doing that, we also want to make sure that we're making some adjustments to uh, to the homepage, to the others, and we've had preliminary discussions with uh, with the, the um, deputy uh, deputy mayor and with Andrew Krebs in the mayor's office about this. So, and what are our plans? What are our plans, though, to actually involve external audiences in that feedback? It sounds like we're speaking internally, but we're not talking to our citizens very much. Um, well, that that would be a next a next phase of this process because we've only just sat down to describe that we have this uh, need to migrate to the next version and the opportunity to um, to make some uh, improvements along the way. So I, you know, I would anticipate that some of our next discussions will focus on, you know, expanding that circle of users, you know, within and outside the city. So I, I would anticipate we'll uh, we'll have some kind of an initiative that looks at that, and I'd be happy to uh, to have your uh, involvement as well as any of your other. And I'd be happy to project. offer it as well. Um, you mentioned just quickly that you report has been a source of feedback. Um, for people who have ideas about the website or something. What are some examples of specific feedback you've gotten that way? What have it, what has it had to do? I don't need a verbatim, but just what have you heard from that? Um, you know, I think some of it is about, uh, you know, search, sorry. Um, we can come back around. Yeah, yeah. let's come yeah. back to that. Further questions from members to ITS? Councilmember uh, President Sims. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Dietz, um, and I may have missed part of this, but earlier you were there was some platform, and I think you alluded to the fact that um, it was preferred in progressive cities or used in progressive cities. Do you recall what that was you were referring to? I should have been listening better, but well, I, I, I can say that you know we have a number of peer cities that we often look to, mm -hmm. uh, especially ones that have significantly more resources uh, than uh, than we do, um, uh, because they've put a, a lot more I think time and and effort and have that ability. So you know I think Boston is one that we we look to quite a bit, and and they're they're also using the same uh, same web platform uh, as we are uh, uh, Drupal, and so they've they've been good uh, good colleagues and examples you know for us you know likewise with uh, a number of other you know digital services they uh, they have a, a substantial roster of of um, things that they have uh, developed that we can uh, we can incorporate some of the what they have learned. Uh, in their work. Okay, so when you were talking about progressive cities, you weren't talking about political leanings or other political identifiers. Yeah, but, you know that's correct. I was thinking more in terms of of their embrace of, of technology as a, as an effect effective tool for for progress. Okay, thank you. Um, and we're also um, throughout every presentation going to hear a lot about equity and inclusion. 
And in some cases, I'm struggling to see how that fits. Um, or is it just like a mouthpiece thing? I'm not saying that in your particular case, but my specific question is having to do with partnerships. And we've talked about um, helping um, the community, those that need it, with in particular internet service. Um, and I'm thinking, as we have been talking about for years, along the lines of fiber optic. Um, and I know there's some expense, there's all of that, but that still should be part of our conversation um, in planning. So I guess my question is, are we still thinking in terms of maybe forming a partnership of some sort um, in order to, to expand our, our technology as far as internet use to, to folks? Yeah, my, my quick answer is I mean, eventually. Time. Well, that's all you, 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 you can go Yes, we that. continue yes. to okay. explore options uh, and potential partners to help us elevate our, uh, our broadband. And Finish your okay. sentence, Mr. Dietz. Oh, sorry, we continue to explore partnerships to elevate our broadband in Bloomington. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Further second round questions. Uh, let's go back to one more. Councilman Campbell, you had a question you wanted to finish? I'm actually just going to hold off and do it in writing, but thank you. Okay, I've, I've got one more. Uh, Mr. Dietz, there's uh, still a couple of devices that uh, I'm waiting to hear from, to hear about, uh, to be installed in the council chambers for when we someday hopefully get back there. Uh, one of them was a, a second Crestron screen to go on the dais between the president and the parliamentarian to control the room in the same way that the first device does at the executive desk. What is the status of that device? Um, yeah, the second Crestron unit is on order uh, right now. I'm not sure when the delivery date is, but, um, but yeah, it, 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 it's on order as discussed. That's good news. The second question is uh, the status of the uh, monitor or IOS device at the podium. Uh, if we were in chambers tonight, you would be speaking at that podium. Uh, where is that monitor that would allow people speaking in the chamber to see the timer in the same way that we can see it on the screen here? Uh, we have a, uh, we've got a test unit, which is a Wi-Fi to HDMI connector that we would need to test out uh, for that. You know, I think there are some potential concerns about um, accessibility, you know, with that and the logistics of placing it and make, making sure that the lectern is still uh, still usable. Uh, but we, you know, we intend to test, test something out. Um, but I also think it's the kind of thing that we won't yeah, you know, won't quite know what is is needed until we're able to get you know that unit out and 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 test it in a in a meeting. But I would say that we've worked very closely with uh, with Stephen Lucas um, on this, and and you know we'll we'll continue to to do that to test out the operations of all of this you know remote uh, you know, remote access and hybrid hybrid meeting. Uh, meeting gear. Well, just to follow up, will the uh, device be uh, freestanding like the Crestron or will it be installed into the podium? Uh, what was your intent there? Um, you know, our intent is to see if we can, you know, make it work uh, with, you know, a, a Wi-Fi uh, device, you know, that, that feeds, you know, a HDMI video feed into, you know, a small, um, small monitor. Right, uh, would, but would the monitor stay on the podium, or would it be on a freestanding stand? Uh, what What did you have in mind? I don't have anything in mind. I think you know it could be you know, it could be either of those. It, you know, it could be that you know when we're actually physically in the room, that might not be as necessary. Um, it might not be as necessary to have separate devices. Connected to. I'll, the I'll save you the trouble. The is, is it's necessary. Okay. But uh, thank you for working on it. Okay. Uh, are there any last minute questions before we go to the public? 
Seeing none, we're gonna to go to the public for comment on the information technology services budget. budget. Uh, if you would like to speak to the budget, please um, uh, click on the raise hand function in Zoom or type into the chat and the meeting host will recognize you. So anyone who would like to speak to the ITS budget. I do not see any raised hands at this time. I did have a question in the chat from um, Sam Dove, ask, uh, the person with the screen name, Sam Dove, asking if I would read a comment. Um, and I, I did not receive the comment. So um, I think- Well, at least we know that there was interest in making a comment. Uh, last call for comments on the ITS budget. Seeing none, we'll come back to the council for debate. Are there any final comments on the ITS budget before we take a straw vote? Anyone? Last call for comments on the ITS budget. Seeing none, we'll go to a straw vote. I will go uh, forwards on my screen as I see members, starting with Council Member Sandberg. Yes. Council Member Scambaluri. Yes. Council Member Sims. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Pass. Council Member Flaherty. Dane. Councilmember Rollo. Yes. Councilmember Rosenbarger. Abstain. And I also abstain. That vote is 306. Mr. Dietz, thank you for the presentation. Uh, we're going to move on to the next budget now. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Stephen Lucas, who is in suit and tie to present the Office of the Common Council's budget. Uh, Mr. Lucas, welcome. Uh, you have, I think, is it 15 minutes for this one or 10? It is, it's 15. All right, give the man his 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me and see my screen? Yes and yes. Perfect. Well, uh, good evening, council members. Uh, my name is Stephen Lucas, as council member Volan just mentioned. I am the council uh, administrator and attorney, and it's my pleasure uh, to present the 2022 uh, proposed budget for the Bloomington Council uh, Office. So why does the council exist? Uh, well, the common council is the legislative body for the city of Bloomington. The council exercises its legislative powers by taking action in public meetings to adopt ordinances, resolutions, and motions for the government of the city and the control of the city's property and finances. The council strives to perform this function in an open, effective, and deliberative manner. The council is made up of nine members of the community Three at-large members represent the city as a whole, while six members represent specific geographic districts uh, within the city. The work of the council is supported by three staff members and during certain parts of the year, an, an O'Neill Service Corps fellow. During, uh, excuse me, since 2020, the council has also utilized uh, several different standing committees to divide up the work of the council. Uh, and that work has included several notable items, uh, which I'll mention here shortly. Uh, before I dive into uh, updating you on the 2021 budget goals, um, I'd like to voice uh, appreciation uh, that I think the mayor mentioned at the beginning of tonight uh, to uh, the excellent work of council staff members, uh, Heather Lacey and Becky Bustani, uh, during what has been an incredibly stressful uh, year and a half. And I'd also like to thank the council members and the public uh, for your patience as we all figured out how to continue meeting and operating during, during the pandemic. So I'll go through some 2021 budget goals and run through a few highlights. Uh, first, under the council's uh, legislative duties activity, um, I've seen this council make a concerted effort to look at legislation through uh, the lenses of both diversity and inclusion, as well as sustainability. 
A few of the legislative acts of council that have attempted to further these goals uh, include resolutions to denounce and condemn white nationalism and white supremacy, uh, supporting the painting of two Black Lives Matter street murals, recognizing the 52nd anniversary of the Stonewall riots and the June celebration of Pride Month, um, and toward sustainability, uh, the council has recently adopted uh, the City of Bloomington's Transportation Demand Management Plan and accepted the City of Bloomington Climate Action Plan, which I know are items the mayor also mentioned. Uh, beyond these uh, legislative actions, a few other uh, notable items from the past year uh, include the council's support of the city's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, two of the major ways that's happened uh, is through the approval of funding and programs as part of the city's Recover Forward initiatives, and those initiatives are housed in several different departments. And more recently, through approval of a first round of expenditures from the, the Federal American Rescue Plan Act funding that has been received by the city, which again will be implemented through several different departments. Uh, as part of this ARPA funding, the council and the administration have uh, made a substantial investment toward another important goal of the council, uh, affordable housing. Uh, the council approved over $1.5 million to support affordable housing options, uh, to also help individuals experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity, and to help increase landlord participation in Section 8 uh, and other similar housing programs. Uh, a few other notable legislative acts. Uh, toward the end of 2019, the council went through the process of repealing and replacing the city's unified development ordinance. And earlier this year, uh, that process was completed when the council adopt adopted several uh, ordinances to make final text corrections and amendments to the UDO and to adopt a new official zoning map for the city. Um, over the last year, the council has also created two uh, new citizen-led commissions to research topics on public safety, uh, best practices, and also to advise the council and make a recommendation on uh, redistricting after the 2020 census. Uh, finally, I'll just note one other major item that was brought up earlier, uh, that is the annexation proposal currently before the council, uh, which will continue until um, the, the middle of next month. Uh, just real quickly, by the numbers, the council this year uh, through August has adopted 26 ordinances and 25 resolutions. Uh, this compares to 30 ordinances and 16 resolutions for the entirety of last year. And in 2019, those numbers were 26 ordinances and 19 resolutions. So to get all of this work done, the council employs staff members who, among other duties, engage in policy development and coordination, both with council members and other city departments. Uh, one big update to this activity in involves the adjustments that we've made uh, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In March of 2020, the council and staff shifted most of uh, our work uh, online as we are operating now. Um, since last year, council staff has worked uh, to ensure that you all can continue to perform your legislative functions safely while also ensuring public access to the work of the council. Uh, in this regard, and as mentioned by uh, Mr. Dietz just a moment ago, uh, we've been collaborating with various city departments uh, to prepare for in-person council meetings that also allow for individuals, uh, including council members, uh, city staff members, and members of the public to participate in the meeting electronically. Uh, these hybrid meetings will hopefully increase accessibility of council meetings for the public and for all involved. Uh, just anecdotally, I believe we've seen an increase in public engagement in council members um, as members of the public can now both watch council meetings from home, but also uh, can now participate and comment from home as well. Uh, just over the last year, we've had a number of meetings attended by well over 100 members of the public. Um, and again, I'd like to thank the council and the public for being flexible and patient as we've worked through new ways of conducting business uh, during the pandemic. Uh, two additional goals that we'll continue to work on in the upcoming year uh, include coordinating with the clerk's office and the ITS department to implement new document management uh, software to hopefully improve the workflow 
uh, of staff and to make meeting materials and documents more accessible to the public. And um, as we did at the start of 2021 in reviewing the council uh, committee structure, we'll continue to look at ways to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of council, council meetings and council committee meetings. Another major activity of the council is making decisions regarding certain discretionary funding uh, that is made available for specific purposes. Uh, these efforts include the work of the Council's Jack Hopkins Committee and the Sidewalk Committee. Uh, since the fall of 2020, the Jack Hopkins Committee has worked to distribute uh, over $700,000 to dozens of different social service agencies in the community. Uh, similarly, the, the Council's Sidewalk Committee in late 2020 and early 2021 made recommendations for the use of $330,000 from the City's Alternative Transportation Fund uh, to help pay for the construction or design of sidewalk or pedestrian improvement projects. And I'll just note that this committee's responsibilities were folded into the Council's Transportation Committee earlier in 2021. Uh, so moving forward, that committee will fill this role. Uh, finally, each year, the uh, Council sends four members to participate on the Public Safety Local Income Tax Committee, uh, which is a group that uh, involves collaboration with representatives from Monroe County, Ellettsville, and Steinsville on allocations made each year for public safety purposes. And more information and detail about the work of each of these committees is available on the Council's website. Uh, just briefly, uh, the last 2021 budget goal update is uh, on constituent services. Uh, as I've mentioned, the ongoing public health emergency has meant uh, much of staff's work has shifted to remote work, uh, which has meant many of our interactions with the public and many of yours are now handled via email. Uh, staff has received and responded to approximately 500 constituent messages that have come into the council office so far this year, and that does not count the individual uh, messages and communications you all have directly with constituents. So I will uh, mention a few of the notable goals that we're going to continue to work on in 2022. Uh, first, the Council's legislative duties in a given year often depend on what's happening in the city uh, and is reflected by the legislation brought by the administration to the Council, as well as the legislation proposed by Council members themselves, uh, which can be difficult to predict in advance. Uh, however, the Council and staff will continue to look at ways to improve public access to the activities of the Council uh, including, again, the implementation of uh, new document creation and management uh, software and the continued use of Zoom uh, to allow for hybrid council meetings. Uh, under policy development and coordination, uh, staff will continue to work with both council members, the administration, uh, members of the public, and various uh, committees to develop policy and best practices. Uh, this activity entails researching questions that arise, providing guidance, and otherwise helping facilitate the work of the Council and its committees. In the remaining months of 2021 and moving into 2022, Council members and staff will continue the work of the Jack Hopkins Committee and the former Sidewalk Committee, now, now the Transportation Committee. Uh, we continue to look at ways to improve each of those processes, and one change to the Jack Hopkins uh, process that was made this year and might prove, uh, uh, may provide an efficiency for future years, uh, included electronic agency presentations, which I believe were uh, well received from agencies who appreciated the increased flexibility that uh, presenting from their home or office offered. Uh, I'll note each year a survey is distributed to agencies to assess that year's process and to gather feedback in order to make improvements. Uh, under sidewalk funding, uh, again, previous committee members have expressed a strong desire to review the objective cri criteria that are used each year as part of that review process to make sure that they are using the most relevant metrics uh, when making funding recommendations and council staff will continue to coordinate with city planning staff ahead of the 2022 funding process. Uh, next year, council staff will continue to uh, strive 
to provide timely responses to constituent contacts. Uh, in this regard, I'll, I'll mention that the council office has recently acquired an office cell phone uh, to hopefully provide for increased flexibility and responsiveness to constituent calls. And the last goal I will note uh, falls under the activity of legal counsel. Uh, council staff includes two attorneys who strive to uh, represent and perform work on behalf of the council. And uh, one stated goal that I'd like to highlight this year is uh, to attend at least 12 hours of training uh, for each of your attorneys, uh, both to maintain our licenses, but also to stay informed on emerging issues or changes to in the law. Um, and over the past year, I've seen the importance of these trainings um, uh, to stay in contact with officials and other communities when uh, new issues arise as they have over the last year. I will briefly uh, mention some of the major changes within each of the four categories. Um, if I don't address uh, one of the budgeted items in our department budget that you're interested in, please, please ask about that and I'm happy to address questions. Uh, category one entails an increase of just over, just under 2%. Uh, most of that is attributable to the 2.75% raises uh, proposed citywide. Uh, category two, uh, there is a requested decrease of uh, a little over $1,100 due to the removal of some one-time uh, software purchases in 2021. Category three has a large uh, decrease due to the removal of one-time uh, Recover Forward program funding that was made part of the Jack Hopkins program uh, over the last uh, year. Uh, just to note that the amount of Category 3 funding from the general fund increases uh, $607, or under 1%. And finally, there is a requested increase of $6,000, or about 1.8%, uh, to provide uh, additional funding for sidewalk and traffic calming projects. Um, overall, the council office budget decreases about 22%. Again, most of that coming from the removal of one-time funding uh, made available for the Jack Hopkins process as part of the city's Recover Forward efforts. And hopefully these uh, budget requests reflect uh, goals of community service, transparency, public engagement, and accessibility. I thank you for your time. And I'm happy to answer any questions. That was impressive. Perfect. Right on the dot. Well done. All right. Uh, do we have questions for the Common Council budget from members of the Common Council? Council Member Piedmont Smith, you have three minutes. Yeah, um, I was just hoping that um, Mr. Lucas could confirm the funding for the Busker Chumley Theater. I see in our grants line, we have $55,000 and I assume that is for the BCT? That is correct, yes. That's one of the several items that haven't changed since last year that I, I sort of glossed over, but that, that is still present in the budget, yes. All right, thank you. Further questions from members? Council Member Rosenbarger, three minutes. Thank you. Uh, does the city use a uh, an inflation rate like across the board? Do we does, does every department you know standardize that for a particular expense? For any expense, I guess. Like if we're just looking at like inflation in the U.S., I mean, is that what we're going off of to like change numbers just based on inflation? That may be a Jeff Underwood question. I can tell you that in the in the council office, we've tried to anticipate the actual expenses that we'll run into next year. Uh, we look at how much of uh, our budget we've used over the last several years to to try to estimate how much uh, is an appropriate amount for you know supplies and, and other types of services. So, um, Mr. Underwood, I don't know if you'd like to add anything to to this, but uh, we try to look at the actual expenses and, and what those will cost uh, in the coming year for our department. 
And I'll confirm that that's what we ask every department to do is, you know, in some cases, material costs go down, sometimes they go up. Uh, if we have no really good idea, we we'll use an inflationary rate, but typically we try to estimate what we think the actual service or material is going to cost. Okay, this this is in like specifically looking at the alternative transportation fund that we used, I think, 1.8%. So that's a hard one, right, where it's not a service. So we're not like looking at the expenses of it. It's just a fund. So I was wondering if I thought 1.8 is low or normal. Well, I can say that is... Uh, consistent with the increase in that fund over the last several years. Uh, both that fund and the Jack Hopkins fund have increased roughly by, uh, I, I think, 2%. You, you point out that over time, it's the percentage has gone down because the total amount has gone up. Um, and I, I uh, would also say that uh, uh, just from my experience working with that committee, the costs uh, associated with construction have, have increased uh, likely more than 1.8%. So um, uh, perhaps uh, someone from planning and transportation could weigh in on, on the, the cost of building sidewalks, but um, uh, I will say that the increase uh, aligns with, with the increases uh, that have been brought forward in past years. Okay, that's, that's good to know where it's coming from, and we can just tackle that when we get to the planning and transportation department, I think. Thanks. Thank you. Further questions for the Common Council budget from members? Councilmember Flaherty, three minutes. Uh, yeah, I just had a kind of similar question about both the Jack Hopkins and, and sidewalk um, alternative transportation funds and kind of how those numbers are arrived at. I know, um, you know, we have historic practice and sort of what, what has been the status quo with those categories, but uh, how do we... Is it just sort of following what, what, what has been practiced or does the administration, um, the mayor's team weigh in on what they think is an appropriate amount? How is that coordinated with, um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's quite obvious, I guess, with the alternative transportation fund that there are other transportation related initiatives that also get funding in a different department. I think you could probably say the same about Jack Hopkins that there's things we do in other departments that complement and overlap with. Um, so is, is there much of a strategic conversation about how to unify those things or, or um, what the appropriate balance is there? Or is this a bit more of, uh, you know, going off of what, what it has been the previous year? I hope that makes sense. I think so. And I, I can try to answer and Mr. Underwood can, can jump in if, <laughs> if I uh, go off the rails. Um, I think it requires a commitment on both the mayor's part and, and the council's part. Um, Certainly uh, last year uh, and, uh, and this year, you saw an increased commitment uh, by both the mayor and the council to provide uh, one-time uh, amounts towards Jack Hopkins um, to respond to the pandemic. Uh, prior to that, um, I, I think each year the uh, proposal tries to keep pace with inflation um, to some extent. Um, if there were, uh, certainly a, a council member that wanted to propose uh, a major change. Uh, council staff, I, I try to uh, learn about any, any uh, proposed changes early on in the budget process so that we can coordinate with, uh, with the administration. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if that gets at all of your parts of your question. Um, if I've missed any, please let me know. I think so. Um, and I'll just briefly follow up. I mean, we're a bit of an odd department in that um, I suppose it would be any of the nine of us uh, as, as elected officials um, suggesting that we go in one direction or another to, to council staff. But uh, I suppose that puts uh, council staff in a bit of an odd position if we're not of one mind <laughs> to, to develop or craft a budget. Um, it, I don't know. I, I, I will, I'll add, I, I do try to seek feedback from you all on, on what you'd like me to propose <laughs> to both the administration and then to you. And uh, absent some clear direction, uh, the staff often defaults to uh, past practice. That's helpful, thank you. All right, any further questions for the council budget? Uh, first round questions, no? We'll go back to Council for Piedmont Smith, three minutes. 
Yes, uh, I was just wondering, Mr. Lucas, if anybody had um, brought up the possibility of um, not having the sidewalk fund in the city council budget and instead putting it into uh, planning and transportation where other sidewalk funds reside and or engineering. Was that discussed at all? I don't believe I received that feedback as part of the budget proposal. I will say I've heard comments <laughs> along those lines uh, from, from council members uh, in, in the sidewalk committee uh, meetings. Um, so it's, it's not a new idea. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I could get into more detail if you'd like. No, that's fine. Thank you. Any more questions for the Common Council budget? Seeing none, we'll go to the public for comment on the Common Council budget. If you would like to speak to this budget, please use the raise hand function in Zoom or type into the chat. Ms. Lacey, who do we have on tap? We have Greg Alexander, who should be able to unmute. Mr. Alexander, you'll have two minutes. Please go ahead. Great. Um, thanks. Uh, my name is Greg Alexander. Uh, I'm often reminded of how crucial the Council Sidewalk Fund is. I recently noticed a new sidewalk gap on the east side of College Avenue uh, across from Kroger by the town town post office. I never noticed it before because I always walked in the parking lots there, but now the post office put up a fence and suddenly, bam, a gap. And the gap actually extends south for a couple blocks. This is a stone's throw from the convention center. The city proposes to spend on the order of $100 million to activate this area, but there isn't any plan for even building a sidewalk network there. There are gaps like this on all of our major roads. For example, we're talking about annexation, but if you look at the donut holes, they border parts of 2nd Street and Allen Street that have been part of the city for decades, yet they have huge sidewalk gaps. Sometimes it looks like you're conspiring with the county to enforce a rule, no sidewalks in poor neighborhoods. They'll get sidewalks when they gentrify through redevelopment and not a second sooner. It's hard to have hope when I look at how this fund is already being spent. This year, a sidewalk was built on one side of 14th Street, just east of Madison Street. When it was scheduled, we were told it was selected because the tiny one block project was needed to fit within the tiny amount of money left in the fund. But it's more discouraging than that even. The city paid for a five foot wide sidewalk. You know, the city had to hire a planning consultant to tell us the obvious. They wrote sidewalks, quote, should be clear of any and all fixed obstacles, unquote. But from the moment this new sidewalk opened, there's a tree partially obstructing it. So there's only four clear feet. If you walk over there as a group or a family, you feel that pinch. I filed your report, contacted engineering directly. Why do we have so many documents saying it's important to provide a comfortable sidewalk when we're still ducking and dodging trees, even where you all have just directly spent money? I tell you this every year, you need to pass a huge infrastructure bond, at least $30 million. Sidewalks are more important than parking garages. Sidewalks are more important than Switchyard Park. Show staff that it is a priority. We cannot have progress without a sidewalk network. Simply having sidewalks is the bare minimum. Once we fund sidewalks, that will not be mission accomplished, but still, we got to fund sidewalks. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Further comments? on the Common Council budget from the public. I don't see any um, raised hands and I do not have any messages in the chat. Thank you, Ms. Lacey. Last call for public comment on the council budget. See none, we'll come back to the council for debate on the council budget. Are there any comments from members? Council Member Rello, two, uh, three minutes. Just to extend my gratitude to Mr. Lucas and Ms. Lacey and Ms. Bastani for their help uh, over the past year, often at times when uh, things have come very late um, in, the, in the legislative process and they've, they've worked very hard on our behalf and I wanted to extend my gratitude for that. Thank you. Thank you. Further debate on the Common Council budget. Any comments? Councilmember Piedmont-Smith, three minutes. Yeah, um, I, uh, mea culpa, I should, <laughs> I should have paid closer attention this summer when uh, Mr. Lucas um, uh, asked for our input because I, I do feel like the sidewalk um, uh, money should actually not be with the city council. Um, I think it should be with 
the uh, the rest of the money for uh, pedestrian infrastructure, which I believe is in most in engineering and planning and transportation, um, and that the decision on how to spend our sidewalk funds should really be uh, separated from um, political concerns of council members. Um, but since I did not say that, <laughs> I'm still going to uh, to support this budget and we can uh, have further discussions about uh, the future of this money and where it should reside. I also take to heart um, what uh, Mr. Alexander said and what I uh, have have thought for a long time that we need to um, explore bonding and TIF money for sidewalks. Uh, that's that's essential infrastructure that we need to make uh, a more viable alter alternative for people of all ages um, if we are ever going to reduce our, our greenhouse gas reduction substantially. So, um, in in that vein, I, I will be looking for uh, for other ways to fund sidewalks uh, in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you. Any other final comments on the budget, Councilmember Flaherty? Three minutes. Yes, thank you. And thank you, um, echoing the comments of Councilmember Rallo to, to all of our great staff for the support uh, this year. And, and uh, it's been a difficult one. So um, I, I share Councilmember Piedmont Smith's uh, views that um, I, I think generally sustainable transportation infrastructure is chronically underfunded in this city. Uh, and one of my priorities for the 2022 budget is to start to move in the, in a better direction in line with our adopted goals and plans on that, on that front. And, uh, this, you know, the things like, well, a handful of things, the bus group Chumley funding, frankly, the, the Jack Hopkins funding, the sidewalk funding all in the council budget. Um, the most logical of those to me maybe is Jack Hopkins funding, but I don't, I think all three of them, an argument could be made that they should be housed elsewhere, elsewhere, even if the council is involved in some way. Um, and, and like Councilmember Piedmont Smith, I did not ask for those changes uh, to Mr. Lucas uh, this summer, but I don't think of that as precluding changes that can happen. I, I think of all of these uh, budget meetings over the next four days as um, kind of the first step in a process, and hopefully we do and can't, you know, can and do see changes. Uh, to a number of departments' budgets uh, based on council member feedback and ongoing uh, collaboration and conversations. Um, so uh, again, this interacts a little bit with what we'll hear later in the week from planning and transportation, but uh, I, I think we need to take a, a more systemic look and approach at how we're funding uh, pedestrian infrastructure, among other things. Uh, we have policies now for neighborhood greenways, for instance, and I think from a, a policy and planning perspective, uh, we could probably do better than uh, separating some of these things out. Um, so I'll continue to follow up on that uh, throughout this week and, and in the weeks to come and uh, maybe push for some changes on that front. So for that reason, I'm gonna uh, vote no on the council budget. Thank you. Thank you. Further uh, comment on the council budget? If not, I'll take it an opportunity. Um, since the council budget has become effectively a discussion about transportation, I will point out the irony of today being the day that the uh, brand new 4th Street garage opened for use. Uh, the annual bill for that garage, which we bonded for, has got to be at least triple what we spend on sidewalks every year, just the annual bill. Uh, that's for that garage alone. So if there's any one, and you know, uh, sidewalks in contrast are the kind of thing that are only used by uh, pedestrians, occasionally used by wheeled vehicles like bikes and scooters, even though they're not supposed to be. And of course they don't accommodate cars. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think anyone has ever said we should uh, convert all the money we spend on roads and cars to uh, alternative transportation, uh, again, a term that I don't like, um, but this is a drop in the bucket. It always has been. Um, we do need to be thinking about bonding for infrastructure. And by that, I mean non-car infrastructure, bonding for sidewalks, bonding for, for paths, bonding for, uh, you know, bike lanes that are more than just a stripe on the pavement, but actually provide comfort and safety to people on bikes. Of course, we don't see people riding bikes and walking, 
because they don't have comfortable places to do it. If we made it nicer, people would do it. If we had more buses, people would use it. If they ran more often, it, the, the, the nice service has to come before people will use it. Uh, the high comfort service has to come before people will use it. So until we, as a city, collectively get serious about that, we're going to keep having this debate. Um, but yeah, it, it's, having said that, it's ironic that uh, these things are still in the council budget. Um, I think it's incumbent upon the administration to take them out of the council budget um, and to move them to where they belong and uh, to seriously fund more than just car infrastructure. It opened today. It's a very nice looking building. It does a lot of other things. It even includes bike parking, but it also points to the irony of this budget. Any other debate? If not, we'll call for a vote. Okay, I'll call for a vote. I'll go backwards with the person who's latest on my screen, Council Member Rosenberger on the Common Council budget. Abstain. Uh, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Flaherty. No. Council Member Rollo. Yes. President Sims. Yes. Council Member Sandberg. Yes. Council Member Sandberg. Oh, thank you. Council Member Scambolari. Yes. And that leaves me, and I am a no. So that is six, two, one. All right, thank you. We'll go now to the, I believe the final budget of the evening and that would be um, the office of the mayor. And I believe Deputy Mayor Don Griffin is here to make the presentation. And I believe they've asked for, sorry, did I miss one? Excuse me, yes, I, I believe you did. I believe the controller's office is next. Oh, I'm sorry, and, I, and I, my bad, yeah. I believe, it, I believe it's going to be Jeff McMillan yeah. Oh, that's right. Yes. With, Mr. Um, McMillan, are you here? I am. Good. I think you have 10 minutes. Is that right? Okay. Let me share the screen. And thank you, Ms. Lacey. I, uh, I missed that. Okay. Please okay. go ahead. The screen there. I don't see a screen yet. Yeah, I can see it. Yes. Okay, while we exist, the Indiana State Legislature passed a law to establish the position of controller duties. Uh, <clears throat> the controller's office is an internal service department that oversees all the financial transactions, processes, and protocols <clears throat> for the city of Bloomington's 22 departments. An additional oversight and interaction with uh, other agencies, Bloomington Transit, Bloomington Housing Authority, Redevelopment Commission, and a few more there on the screen. Let's see. <clears throat> Background of the controller is the city's chief financial officer. Uh, there's 11 staff that is responsible for accounts payable, accounts receivable, payroll, grants, annual budget, internal controls, federal, state, and local reporting, police and fire pensions, and also <clears throat> major initiatives, initiatives with financial oversight that include the following list of uh, Switchyard Park Convention Center, current and new hospital uh, parking garages, and a document management system and community-wide development system. And oops, 21 budget goals. The uh, core uh, accounts receivable functions, accounts payable. Uh, we look to increase our um, electronic funds transfer payments through the end of the fourth quarter. Uh, we, want we want to ensure all payments to all city departments from all, sorry, from all city departments are deposited within the statutory requirement of one business day. Uh, last year, we had roughly 3,700 entries or journals that were deposited. And we want to maximize the rate of return on our investments and reduce our banking and minimize our banking fees. Uh, budgeting, uh, manage and coordinate activities related to the development of 
the, in the submission approval of the city's annual budget, um, adhere to the guidelines of the budget and improve con uh, consistency across the organization. Also to improve a budgeting process, uh, we've made uh, further efforts to utilize the level of budgeting identified, not only dollars, but also FTEs or full-time equivalents and populations served in the budget. Uh, research and special projects. Uh, we are converting the gap, the, our financials to a gap basis that will let us be able to apply for the GFOA uh, certificate of financial reporting. And also uh, we've been implementing the community development and document management system. 22 budget goals. Um, counts payable to increase electronic funds transfer, cuts down the amount of checks we have to write and hoping to get that from 76 to 78 percent. Uh, revenue collections, um, again, to get them deposited by the statutory requirement of the next day and to ensure, any, to ensure that any corrections are made within two business days. Um, and right now, and that is below 1 percent of the total. Payroll, uh, we issue payroll to the, all the employees at disbursements biweekly. We issue tax reports within uh, the month uh, for federal and then by the 20th of the month for state. All manual checks uh, we have issued within one business day of receiving the request. Purchasing. Um, decreased staff time associated with the purchase order process by training new employees and who will be involved in the purchasing process at New World. And also decrease the cost of items purchased by re reorganizing vendor categories and commodity numbers assignments. Budgets, um, we have over 500 budgets in 22 departments. Uh, so coordinate with the city departments to ensure the documentation is completed and distributed prior to initial visit presentations and August of 22 and issue announcements at least 10 days before public hearing. Issue the packet to council for the Friday before the hearings and submit the proposed budget documentation within the five day time frame, time frame after it's approved by the council to the DLGF. Research and special projects uh, to obtain the GFOA or Government Finance Officers Association Certificate of Achievement for Financial for Excellence in Financial Reporting, uh, can, and also converting the statements to a GAAP basis. Uh, let's see, also special projects monitor and make rec recommendations by fourth quarter for the public safety local income tax, which includes the dispatch, Lincoln police and fire requirements, provide, provide ongoing support for the convention center, so supported by the food and beverage tax, and the trades district for redevelopment of existing hospital sites. Continue to roll out the functionality and document management and community development software. Internal audit. Uh, so to implement and oversee the design of uh, effectiveness of internal controls and segregation of duties throughout the city to uh, minimize the risk of fraud and misuse of city assets. And the goal there is to obtain a, good, a clean uh, opinion from the State Board of Accounts without major findings. Budget highlights. Uh, category three is uh, we're, we're requesting $1,110,035, which is an increase of $400,000 compared to 21. Uh, it's related to project management. I believe we had a similar increase in 20 and then not in 21. So uh, here's a 
the controller's office budget summary. Our total budget is $2,186,579. And in conclusion, the uh, 2022 Office of the Controller's Budget request reflects inc increases that align with the state, state, yeah, stated goals of uh, accounts receivable, payables, payrolls, grants, purchasing, annual budget, internal audit, and control with significant special projects with other financial oversight. Thank you for your consideration of the Office of the Controller's budget. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Very good. And, and Paul shared, you shared. Very good. Oh. Okay. And our timer was back down again briefly, but if you could please unshare your screen. Um, um, no, Chair Bolin. I, yes. I am I am unable to get the timer to um, function. I've refreshed and kind of done all the troubleshooting that can be done. I'm not sure um, what the malfunction is, but can keep time manually on my. If if you will, phone. we're sorry to make you do the hand signaling thing. I, but, I'm uh, and I'm terribly sorry, but. Uh, well, we thank you for your service, and uh, we're going to have to get ITS to look into the Blue Sky Timer. All right. Are there questions for Mr. McMillan and the controller's budget? Councilmember Piedmont-Smith, you'll have three minutes. Please keep an eye on Ms. Lacey. Yes, thank you, Mr. McMillan. Um, so uh, the $400,000 $400, increase in... Uh, Category three for project management, is that um, to outsource project management or what more precisely is that used for? Yes, yes. That would I'll, be jump, in. I'll okay. jump in and answer. I'll answer questions on our budget. Thanks, Jeff. For <laughs> uh, it was just to give me a break. Uh, yes, it's uh, for outsourcing um, initially uh, to look at some of the large, to, again, as, as the mayor's talked about and, and uh, Carolyn Shaw is uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes departments, uh, including ours, are stretched thin. Uh, there are major projects that are going on. And the idea is to bring in expertise uh, that can help us project manage it through those projects, such as the long-term project, the hospital reuse, uh, where that'll be very intensive for um, several years uh, should the convention center project ever uh, come back, and I think it will, uh, so projects like that. Thank you. Further questions? on the controller's budget. Going once, going twice. Councilmember Flaherty, three minutes. Sure, thank you, uh, Mr. McMillan for the presentation and, and Mr. Underwood for being here again as well. Um, we touched, uh, I think a few council members touched on this briefly in the, the overview and um, or at least at some point this evening, somebody <laughs> talked about the parking cash out program. Maybe that was in HR actually. And wondering about the appropriateness of 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 where that would be housed. Um, it's while it might be close to budget neutral, it's probably not completely budget neutral. Of course, the goal is to have some people take advantage of the incentive, um, and uh, it depends a little bit on how you structure it. But could you speak any more, Mr. Underwood, to what those ongoing conversations are like as as part of um, meeting with the transportation demand management plan calls for on the parking cash out front, and what a number of council members have been have been asking for for some years now. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, it, it's a little bit more complicated in, in that we have multiple sites where employees park, and th there's the question of equity. Uh, in many of those places, there's no cost to park whatsoever. So the question becomes now do we create parking zones at every uh, city facility and then charge the uh, charge what we would at uh, you know a parking lot or a parking garage, and then you have to build in the um, cost for each of those. So let's say that it's we're going to give every employee um, uh, $500 and, uh, and, and half of them take advantage of the program uh, so there's no cost to them. That is not revenue neutral. It also has impacts on um, taxes. It also has uh, impacts on uh, pensions, payouts. Uh, so we're trying to work through all the logistics, uh, the, you know, figuring out the cost of a particular lot uh, is is not the issue. It's how can we equitably uh, issue this, uh, start this program, and how do we cover the costs for that if it's not revenue neutral? Obviously, uh, decisions have to be made, but we are continuing to work through those. 
Uh, but it would be quite a shock to a lot of our employees where they just pull in and park. It's not permit parking at all. Uh, and now it's permit parking and, and you're going to pay for that. So uh, we are, you know, there, there's pluses and minuses and we're trying to work through all those logistics and, and do this equitably uh, to every employee. Thanks for that. And just a brief follow-up. I mean, policies like this, I mean, I appreciate those constraints and kind of unique considerations to the variety of facilities Bloomington has, but of course, policies like this have been implemented for, for decades in California and other progressive places on, on the climate front. Um, so I think all of those can be worked through. I don't know if I agree with, with quite everything I just heard, but um, I guess my question more so is uh, confirming we, this will not be part of a 2022 rollout for a parking cash out. Is that correct? Uh, it will depend on if we truly can make it revenue neutral, then there would have to be some amendments to um, the um, salary ordinances because obviously it's a payout issue. And if there's a payout issue, it has to be approved by the council. Uh, if, it's, if it's revenue neutral, then uh, there's no, no net cost, then we don't have to appropriate any additional funds. But if it's not revenue neutral, uh, then we would have to appropriate it uh, at that time since we didn't have enough information to make that a, a part of this um, budget request. Uh, we did not put it in, but that's not to say that it can't happen for 2022. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Further questions for the controller's budget? If not, I'll take an opportunity. If I can have three minutes. Oh, Councilor Morello, go ahead, three minutes. Thank you. Mr. Underwood, um, there was a question posed earlier to uh, Ms. Shaw about uh, uh, marketed adjustments for the police department. Um, this is for supervisor salaries. Um, the concern is, is that um, there's too much wage compression and, and officers are making more than supervisors do uh, with their overtime. And since the responsibilities, of course, are greater for supervisors, it uh, puts them in a very difficult position. Uh, we had an understanding I under, uh, that, that, that these adjustments would be made. And you said, I think, that it wasn't present in this budget. But it's, is it incorrect to say that it, it could be done immediately? N no, it, could have it's, these not, adjustments? It's, it's not included in the 21 budget. It is included in the 22 budget request, a yeah. phase of two years where the majority of the increases would be uh, in uh, 22, and then the remainder in 23, uh, to to get that get it get it going. And you're right, compression is always an issue, not only with the police department but for every department in the city. Uh, so we try to look at each one of those and make sure that we have enough separation that we can attract and retain quality people in uh, supervisory and management uh, positions. So uh, this group of people will be the last ones through this cycle of of uh, salary adjustments. But again. Most of those okay. increases will happen in 22. Yes, I understand that, but there's nothing preventing us from doing it in this budget. Uh, and what is we, the what is the what is the amount? I mean, what we're, are we talking about? Fifty or sixty thousand dollars total? Uh, it's more than that. I think it's closer to uh, between seventy-five and hundred thousand dollars. Seventy-five and hundred. Could you come up with that? Could Could you come up with exactly what that would entail? The, the exact amount? To yes. Do it I'll, in this budget. Yes. Terrific, thank you. Steve, you're Sorry. muted. I believe you're muted. I keep forgetting, I'm sorry. Okay, other questions uh, for the controller before I take mine? If not, okay, uh, Mr. Underwood, um, I. I would beg to differ with your characterization of the program as far as it being the idea of a parking cash out program being inequitable um, uh, because for people who are say at the utilities building or who are not commuting to city hall, uh, if the program can be extended to them upon their choosing of, uh, I, I mean, you can, you can reimburse people for taking the bus uh, if they take the bus and they can demonstrate it. Um, but those people who are demonstrating that they're driving to City Hall uh, by buying a permit, they're actually, you know, they're paying right now, we're just charging them $2 a year. So uh, 
you know, if that lot could be used by people other than uh, people who work in City Hall, it would be worth something to those people who currently now park in the Morton Street garage. I guess I don't understand uh, why you think that it's somehow inequitable to give, uh, I mean, if we assume that everyone's gonna keep driving, raise the price and, and, and reimburse them, uh, just charge a, a higher amount, but reimburse them. Why is that inherently inequitable to people who aren't, part, aren't driving to City Hall and paying to park there? They're literally paying to park, not to drive. Well, it's the city hall is and uh, the police department are the only two uh, city facilities that I'm aware of that we require permit parking uh, and okay. require employees to buy those permits. Uh, personally, if we wanted to be equitable currently with everyone, we wouldn't require them to buy permits. You don't have to have a permit to park at um, the city's utility center or any of the plants right. or any of the outlying uh, facilities, parks, or whatever they are, we don't require. It's just it's reserved city parking, and they park in those lots. Right. Um, you know. So now, uh, that's what I'm saying is, from an equity standpoint, is uh, it, you're almost talking about demand. Is there demand for the public to park at Blue Pool? Well, no. There may be a demand for people to park at City Hall, uh, but again, I think we've provided plenty of spaces close to or near to. Um, the city uh, for those people to park that are accessible to them and, and quite frankly, at low prices as well. Uh, you know, if you're talking about an annual permit, I think, yeah, we charge a higher price. If you want an annual permit and you want a completely reserved spot, you pay one price. Uh, if you want a, a, a permit, but you have to, you know, park, pull, uh, park in one of 200 spots, uh, that's a lesser price. Uh, mm -hmm. And then much like what City Hall is, I don't have a reserved spot. If the lot's full, I can't park there. I have to find alternative parking. Uh, now, today, that's not a problem, but there have been times when the lot's completely full and, and I go and either pay or uh, park on the street and feed a meter and- uh, Okay, well, that's my point. Uh, but yeah. thank you for that answer. Um, are there any other questions for the controller's budget? Last call for questions from members before we go to the public. Okay, let's go to the public for comment on the controller's budget. If you would like to speak to this budget, please choose the uh, raise hand function in Zoom or type into the chat. Ms. Lacey, are there any takers? There are no raised hands and no messages in the chat. Last call for public comment on the controller's budget. Please raise, use raise hand in Zoom or type into the chat. Seeing none, we'll come back to the council for debate. Is there any final comment on the controller's budget? Council member Flaherty, three minutes, or three minutes, yeah. Um, yeah, just, just briefly following up on the parking cash out um, program that again is in adopted city plans that we're supposed to implement. Uh, I think there's some, some misunderstandings about how these programs function about what is equitable or not. And, uh, I'm, I'm a little frustrated, frankly. I don't know. Um, again, California <laughs> has been doing this for 30 years. Municipalities, private employers are required to. Uh, we have a plan that says we're supposed to do this. We would like other employers to um, buy into the notion of transportation demand by uh, instead of just building subsidies for parking into salaries, actually taking those out, separating them and saying, if you don't need this, we're going to help compensate and benefit you by taking a more sustainable mode. It's not to harm or penalize anyone. It's just to stop giving an inequitable subsidy to everyone, even when not everyone needs it or uses it. So I think, um, again, I'm, I'm frustrated because this is in adopted plans. It's been called for for years. And I don't feel like, uh, I, I feel like if, if the administration was committed to implementing this, we would we would see it right now. It's, it's always kind of these questions about um, you know, what, what about this particular con uh, contingency or the way this lot is, is oriented? And I, I just, I, I, I don't know. It's, um, I guess those, those answers aren't passing muster to me anymore. So I'll be a no on, on this budget. Thank you. Thank you. Further debate on the controller's budget. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yeah, I agree with Councilmember Flaherty. Um, I mean, we, we've been asking for a parking cash out program for years, you know, even pre-pandemic, 
when things weren't quite as crazy. Um, and I, it just, the, the reasons given uh, that this can't work don't hold water with me. I mean, this is something that has been studied. There are, there are models online that you can call up uh, very easily that, you know, I just, uh, I feel like this is something we need to do that it's our, our plans call on us to do it. Uh, we are going to be asking other employers to do it. So uh, it's really um, would be hypocritical if we didn't move forward with this expeditiously. So um, for that reason, I am going to vote no on the controller's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Further debate on the controller's budget? Second call. Uh, I will take the opportunity to say that uh, the argument that Mr. Underwood made tonight about um, parking cash out was this it was one of the arguments made by other people back in 2012, 2013 over parking meters, that somehow they were inequitable. Um, and yet, uh, most people do not recognize that the inequity happened before there were meters, that the people who uh, got parking spaces, could leave their cars all day, or they would do the two-hour shuffle, and uh, they harmed many different entities. Uh, the way to uh, help people who need subsidy is to uh, give back some of the revenue taken in by meters, but only money, only charging what the market would bear for parking uh, caused people to use it rationally. They were when they were using it rationally before, they were using it selfishly. Uh, now they have to make a harder decision about, well, how much time do I want to be here? Uh, and I'm going to pay for that. Uh, it made the parking garages make more sense too. So uh, the idea that somehow uh, parking cash out is inequitable now doesn't hold any more water than uh, parking meters did. Um, there are at least a complete program that includes parking meters as a control to prevent people from overusing parking that they don't need um, and uh, using some of the revenue to help people who do need help, which we haven't done yet either. So uh, it's disappointing to hear that argument. Uh, that sort of explains, I guess, why we don't have it yet. And I wanna say very strongly that I am for a parking cash out program, which even if everyone in city hall decided to start driving, uh, to stop driving as a result, and let's, say that there are 200 people working in City Hall, and let's say that the permits, uh, a, a permit to park in a garage is $50 a month, um, that's, or 40, 45, whatever, it's $500 a year, that's uh, $10,000 uh, at most. So I don't, uh, oh, and no, I'm getting that wrong, it's $100,000, isn't it? 200 and 500? Yeah, it's $100,000, uh, but that's not gonna happen. It's gonna be more like $10,000. So, uh, and we're going to have more people uh, biking, taking the bus. We're going to be improving our carbon footprint. Uh, with that, if there's no other debate on the controller's budget, I'll call for a vote. I'm going to go backwards from uh, Councilmember Rollo. Yes. Councilmember Rosenbarger? No. Councilmember Piedmont Smith? No. Councilmember Sandberg. Yes. Councilmember Flaherty. No. Councilmember uh, President Sims. Yes. Councilmember Scambaluri. Yes. Councilmember Smith. Yes. And I am a no. So that is four, four, one. And by the way, I have a correction. On the ITS budget, the clerk informs me that the vote was actually 405 and not 306. So just for the record, the vote on the ITS budget was 405, and the vote on the controller's budget is 441. We now go to our last budget for the evening, the budget of the Office of the Mayor, and I see Deputy Mayor Don Griffin here in his first presentation uh, as Deputy Mayor. Welcome, Mr. Griffin. and. Uh, Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Deputy Mayor Don Griffin, and I'm pleased to present to be presenting to you the office 
of the mayor's budget for 2022. Uh, this is my first budget process at the city and I appreciate your feedback and support. The office of the mayor provides strategic direction and leadership to our 17 departments and nearly 800 full-time employees, including Bloomington Transit and the Bloomington Housing Authority. You'll hear budget proposals from each of these cabinet departments over the course of four nights this week. As we have assembled the budget package of approximately $168 million that is entrusted to us by our residents and our visitors. Ooh, pictures. Uh, the mayor's office consists of eight full-time employees and usually two or three student interns. Important roles of the office and staff include, provi include providing strategic direction for the city as an organization, communicating and engaging with the public on issues important to our community, and creating a culture of innovation to improve the efficiency of the services we deliver to residents and visitors. We really have a great team and you can see some of them here. Let's start with some updates on our 2021 goals. We're obviously still in the middle of a pandemic and have had to be agile in our response to keep our staff and community safe. We haven't stopped working though. I'm proud to say that all city functions have continued without pause during the last 18 months. I'm grateful to work with a team of such dedicated city employees and I thank the Office of the Mayor's staff in particular for their commitment and hard work. We continue to make transparency a priority and in 2021 as in past years, we delivered a state of public safety report and we keep working on publishing our regular budget goal updates to increase both transparency and accountability. Communications continue to be a crucial function of our office, both pandemic related and about all of our city programs and services. Our communications director, Yael Cassander, and digital brand manager, Andrew Krebs, produce press releases, videos, social media, and website updates, news conferences, and Facebook live sessions to keep the public informed and engaged with our work. As of July 31st, our communications team has written, edited, coordinated, and distributed almost 180 press releases, which is close to double the number by this time last year. All of these press releases, along with the mayoral speeches and our video series are all posted on the City of Bloomington's website. Our public engagement efforts are led by the tireless Mary Catherine Carmichael, who directs our efforts to seek public input in many different ways. Our team receives countless phone calls and emails about any number of issues and between answering those and attending board and commission meetings and other community events, we work hard to share information with residents, businesses, nonprofits, visitors, and the community, community at large. Our engagement with Indiana University, IU Health, and Monroe County is a great collaboration as we continue to manage the impact of COVID on our community. And of course, at this time of year, both Mary Catherine, I, and Mayor Hamilton, among others, are hard at work welcoming IU students as half of our community's population has returned. We're glad they're here. Now that I needed to be a little more excited about, but let me try that again. We're glad they're here. I also note that we conducted the 2021 community survey this spring with numbers of respondents in line with past survey versions. We will continue to use these survey results to inform what we're doing and how we connect with the community. Finally, our last 2021 budget goals are centered around innovation. Many thanks to our innovation director, Davta Kidd, for always looking for ways to make our city processes more efficient. Davta has been really engaged in analyzing and improving our leafing program which has turned into a cross-department collaboration project. 1,000 households who mulch. 
We look forward to seeing the results of this program and how it will impact our leafing program in the future. Now, let's look ahead at 2022. We are grateful for President Biden for the American, uh, we are grateful to President Biden for the American Rescue Plan Act, which provides us with $22.3 million to transform our community. This gives us the opportunity to invest in community improvement, in quality of life, and truly recovering forward, all through the lens of equality and inclusion and sustainability and climate justice. We also look forward to continued work on the Bloomington Hospital Redevelopment Project, as site construction for the first phase of civil infrastructure should begin in the second quarter of next year. Along with our typical production of press releases and speeches, our social media presence in 2021 has been on par with our historic levels in 2020. Our social media audience has grown by 8%, engagement has grown by 15%, and video views have grown by 10% or 15,000 views over 2020. We certainly expect this growth to trend to continue into 2022 and beyond. In addition, we'll keep trying out new formats for communication in 2022, as we did this year with the video series pictured here. That had more than 66 views and a reach of 17,500 folks. Overall, we will keep trying new ways to be responsive to our community's feedback whether through social media platforms or other formats. Since we conducted a community survey this year, there will be no survey in 2022. We'll look forward to the next survey in 2023. Engagement with the community will continue, however, and we will look and we'll be looking at more regular community engagement surveys via an online public uh, engagement tool in addition to our larger every other year survey. We expect to consider significant changes to our leafing program in 2022 after assessing the Thousand Households Mulch program. Additionally, in 2022, DAVTA plans to work with the Upland Lean Network on continuous learning on lean process improvements. The Office of the Mayor General Fund budget request is just over $1 million, an increase of only 4%. Some significant changes include a 4% increase in our Category 1 request, which cover an overall 2.75% increase in wages and related benefits for non-union employees, as well as a salary increase related to grade changes for both our digital brand manager and our executive assistant positions. Now our category two request increases 125% or $4,300 due to a request for additional technology needs and supplies for both our digital brand manager and innovation director. And finally, our category three request goes up nearly $5,300 or 5%. To more accurate, accurately reflect our bi monthly advertising cost for Bloom Magazine. We've had ads in Bloom Magazine for several years, both in print and online versions, but have never included accurate costs in our annual budget. These additional funds will provide us with more accurate budgeting and tracking of these costs. What we have pictured here is a summary of our 2022 budget request. The table shows our budget from previous years alongside the current re request. We hope that our budget request from the Office of the Mayor aligns with our major initiatives of public safety, equity, civility, and justice, affordable housing, economic development, climate change, and sustainability, transparency and engagement, asset management and investment, innovation, and pandemic response. Thank you for your consideration of the Office of the Mayor's 
2022 budget request. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, Thank you. If you can unshare the screen, we can, there we go. Are there questions for the mayor's budget? Uh, start with Councilmember Sandberg and then Councilmember Scambolari. You have three minutes, Councilmember Sandberg. Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor, uh, in a recent council member, we had an appeal from someone uh, from the Friends of Lake Monroe uh, requesting there be some collaborative funding along with some other governmental units for um, their necessary work. And I'm just asking, does the mayor have any kind of discretionary funding for things of that nature? Or where would a request like that be more appropriate to come from? I, I was a little taken aback that the, the city had not made a commitment to that. Uh, yeah. You kind of stopped on me there. You, you know, I think we, we've had, uh, we, we have um, supported and we still continue to, to uh, support. What are, what are they called? Uh, Friends of Lake Monroe? Is that right? Right. Um, I think we, we have, there, there's another group that, uh, that we're supporting. And I, I think it's, look, we're, on the Friends of Lake Monroe, we are using our staff currently uh, to do a lot of uh, a lot of the gathering of data for <laughs> Friends of Lake Monroe, uh, and not including the things that we've done in the past, the money that we've given them in the past. We're still contributing to the the uh, the um, safety of our water, uh, and and I, I can't. Uh, Maybe Jeff is on online and he can kind of tell us who the other group is, what the other group is called. Like, for instance, would would the utilities department have a vested interest in this? Or again, I'm just kind of asking about the mayor's discretionary. Does he have a pot of money that can be used for these kinds of special requests when we're asked to be collaborators like with Monroe County government and, and other other um, you know governmental units you know not not from the uh, the office of the mayor no uh, um, that would be uh, from from a, maybe a di different department um, but we'd, we'd have to talk to my controller about that mr. Underwood I'm here still um, past my bedtime but I stayed up just for you guys uh, in the past, when we've had these requests come up during the year, you know, we would typically look at, do we have any available funds uh, and what's the appropriate department for those to come out of? In addition, in this particular case, we have provided both funds in, in prior years and a lot of in-kind services, including advertising them on the utility um, bill that gets mailed out and, and sent. Uh, allowing folks to go directly to their website and uh, make contributions uh, to that organization. So uh, with any any uh, cause or, or organization where uh, a request comes in and the mayor's office uh, deems it um, eligible for funding, then it gets punted back to me and I work with department heads and we'll find it. And if not, then uh, you know we do usually at least two uh, appropriations other than the budget where a spring and a fall kind of thing and uh, appropriate funds uh, that we've spent uh, that we need to put those back into the budget for um, the, the original use. So we do have opportunities to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, further questions? I thought I saw Councilmember Scambolari. Three yeah. minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't see Ms. Kidd on the call anymore, so I'll just direct these questions to Mr. Griffin. Um, I, I'm interested in how the Director of Innovation position is evolving. I think we are now in year four or five of that, if I remember correctly. Is that correct? Uh, maybe. You okay. Know, I, well, just, I think you're right, at least two. Oh, she's okay. been here before I was here. Okay. Um, um, I'm. It's not a huge chunk of the mayor's office budget, but I'm curious. It seems to me that part of being an innovation operation <clears throat> can involve identifying external sources of funds, and I'm wondering if that has at all been a part of the work she's the Ms. Kidd is doing. 
you, you mean in, in regards to uh, in, in regards to supporting her programs? Right. Um, so, for example, there, 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 there's a lot that that her department does internally. Uh, she works uh, tirelessly with every department that we have, all 17 uh, departments that we have on uh, innovative things that do not show up uh, in in the the ledger sheet. But she's saving us time and and money um, uh, in in so many different things. Uh, and, like and space I'll, consulting. Go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry. And I'll jump in. Uh, Council Member Scambolari is yes, she does um, solicit outside fundings for grants and other avenues uh, to offset the cost of certain programs. Um, mm -hmm. We I know she's applied for uh, numerous ones where our, it comes to our office to sign off on as well because there may be a matching uh, either in kind or cash. Uh, commitment. So it, yes, it's uh, it's an extensive part of what she does as well. What what kind of success have we seen in that? How many dollars are? Can we account for how many dollars have come in? I that? believe that we can. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, the big one was uh, we didn't qualify for the large dollars, um, but we did qualify for a lot of in kind uh, programming that uh, she trained uh, a person out of every city department and. Uh, they put programs into place. The, the leafing was one of those that came out of it. And I, I, it's just escaping my mind right now. And I think there were a couple of other smaller ones as well as um, uh, or not-for-profit organizations that do um, those kind of small grants. I know she's got a few small grants and then there was this one large one that was uh, mostly in kind. We were hoping we'd make it to the next level, but we didn't quite qualify. But they had us, we were so close, they went ahead and, and offered us a lot of the trainings and things that they normally uh, charge for that we got free of free of charge this time around to help us get over that hump for the next um, um, request. Okay, now I'm out of time for this round, so I'll have a couple more questions next time around. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions on the mayor's budget? Councilman Borrello, three minutes. Thank you. I suppose I'll direct this to Mr. Underwood um, because uh, Deputy Mayor Griffin um, was responding to Councilmember Sandberg's uh, request uh, because I, I was interested in the uh, funding request of Friends of Lake Monroe too. Mr. Underwood, do you, uh, they, they specifically are looking for $50,000 that would um, mirror what the county has offered. And this is for their application for the Clean Water Act, uh, th Section 319, and specifically to fund their watershed coordinator. Is, it, is there another group that is doing that kind of work? Because this is, I think, uh, really important work that is being done to find sources of pollution that are affecting water quality. And, and so it's obviously our concern. Is this being repeated by someone else? I am not aware, I know uh, Deputy Mayor Griffin mentioned it, but I, I, I don't recall that there's, uh, I don't, I know that we're not funding any other group that I can remember. Uh, he, he may be able to correct me, but um, I think this is the, the group that we've been working with directly. I think uh, uh, Alex Crawley is on the board uh, for Friends of Lake Monroe. So um, we have direct input through him as well. So again, a lot of like, at the current time, a lot of like uh, kind uh, services, as well as working with them to uh, alert people to the ability to make tax deductible uh, the donations to that group as well. Well, um, that would be and, and good information uh, to, to know. Sorry. You know, uh, no, um, you know, and we might want to just talk to uh, uh, Vic uh, over at the um, um, our utilities, because he uh, is he is the uh, the uh, employee that is most connected uh, with this group, uh, and he can tell you about his experiences uh, uh, with them and how we are supporting them. So okay. that might, if, if you want to know a little bit more about that, uh, stay tuned. Okay, so probably Alex Crowley and uh, Vic Kelson is who we need to direct the questions too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, I'll jump in just real quick. Uh, our great uh,
contacting the mayor's office, uh, Elizabeth, uh, reminded me that it's Bloomberg that uh, we work with on uh, innovation items and provided the training for us. Thanks, Elizabeth. In four years, uh, it, she's, uh, she, Dave has uh, been in the office for four years, by the way. Okay, uh, next questions from Council Member Piedmont Smith. You'll have three minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to inquire about um, one of uh, the mayor's major initiatives, uh, affordable and workforce housing. Um, in our comprehensive plan, it says that we should develop a detailed housing strategy <clears throat> plan. Um, is it the mayor's office position that the 2020 housing study is the detailed housing strategy plan? And if not, uh, when can we expect a detailed housing strategy plan to be uh, developed? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to have to find out. Okay. I'm, you know, four months on the job. I'll, you know, <laughs> still, still a few things to learn. I understand. Let me see if I but can. I, I, I don't. I don't think I don't think it's it, I don't think what we have is complete yet. So I will tell you that we are working on other strategies. Okay. Well, um, I'd like to have a, a solid answer on that one, but we can get that at okay. another time. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions from members on the mayor's budget. Uh, first round questions. I have one first round question, then I'll go to Councilor Scambellari. Um, what uh, what portion of the advertising budget is going to Bloom Magazine? It was about a hundred thousand dollars altogether. What was what portion of the advertising budget in the mayor's office is specifically going to Bloom Magazine advertising? Is it a large portion, a small portion? Uh, I, I, it, it was only fifty six hundred dollars, if I'm not mistaken. This it was oh, that's a, good. it wasn't a, yeah it wasn't a large amount of money. No. Okay, very good. Thank you, uh, Councilor Scambaluri. Yes, thank you. And I'm sorry, I lost track of which round we were in. Um, I wanted to echo Council Member Piedmont Smith's comments on the idea of a housing strategy. Um, I think we have a lot of very good documents around and good work has been done by many council members. Um, and I think we have an opportunity to connect the dots and, and talk about specifically how that can inform policy. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, a question again on, on our innovation program, the budget request listed or mentioned that part of the responsibilities for the office is coaching staff on their spinoff projects. And I'm wondering what some of those spinoff projects are. Oh my gosh. Um, you didn't write well, it? Yeah, I'm sorry. Do you need me to just do it in writing or? You can do it in writing. I can, I can give you one example. Uh, we're, you know, uh, she is heavily involved with uh, a space consultant on trying to, uh, you know, reimagine what uh, our space at City Hall is going to be like, uh, you know, when we, when we are talking about uh, folks coming back to the office and how much they're going to uh, uh, either stay at the office or work from home. Um, and and uh, so she has been working with uh, uh, Barry Clapper and her or organization on, on trying to do that. Uh, and that's, uh, and that will save us uh, a lot of money. Um, before, before COVID, you had people, uh, there, there just wasn't enough space, uh, in our building for all our employees. And, uh, this has given us an opportunity to reimagine what the space is going to look like. And she has been, uh, just, uh, uh, yes. And a, a great resource. Great. Okay. And I'll do the, I could do the rest in writing. So thank you for taking a run at that. Any other questions for the Office of the Mayor? A council member Piedmont Smith, three minutes. Yes, um, Mr. Griffith, you you mentioned quite rightly that we welcome back the students, uh, 
And um, I was wondering if there were outreach efforts specifically geared towards students and involving them more in city government. Um, can you speak to that at all? You know, I know we've, we've uh, we're, we're working on, and this is a, maybe an HR uh, question too, we're working on uh, expanding our intern, uh, you know, the interns or uh, opportunities for more interns to come into the, uh, to, to the office to experience, um, uh, e experience working in the government. Uh, and maybe, and also, you know, some, some folks, uh, maybe even uh, bringing back a, uh, a program that we once had with, um, uh, um, I can't think of the, uh, but students of color uh, as well. Great. And um, just, but, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, but what about just, uh, you know, reaching out to maybe IU student government or other organizations at IU that can speak, give the student perspective on what we're doing with the city? Uh, has that been considered? Uh, I'm sure it has, but I think that's some great ideas, and I'd uh, love to talk to you more about that. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'll jump in and say that uh, in the past, we have worked with IU to specifically uh, engage uh, professors and student groups for projects on behalf of the city where they do studies on those. We typically have done uh, one to two a year, depending on uh, the professor's needs. Uh, we also engage directly, many of us, with professors at SPIA, the School of Business, and other um, schools in uh, doing speaking and getting feedback from them. Uh, I, I saw Mark Levin was on earlier, uh, and I have a, an annual uh, thing where his students uh, are asked to attend the budget hearings, and then some uh, um, Council Member uh, Sandberg has spoken to the class. I have spoken every year to the class. So I know there's many of the department heads as well as uh, council members that reach out and try to engage with students to uh, get their perspective and, and give them insight on how government works and how it impacts them directly. And I think in the next several weeks, uh, uh, the mayor will actually be meeting directly with the IU student body president um, we also uh, uh, ask students to be on boards and commissions uh, if we can. And um, so there is outreach. Are you finished with your questions? Okay, Councilmember Sandberg, three minutes. Yes, thanks. The uh, conversation about students prompts me to ask what the uh, mayor's relationship is with the new president of Indiana University. So many of our issues here in Bloomington that we have to grapple with are because we are a town gown city. We have many stresses and strains that other university, you know, cities that are not university towns deal with. So how is that relationship going? It's a new one, I would assume. It's going to be a very new one. She's, she's a, have, you, have you met her yet? She's wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're trying to arrange for a meet and greet, a city meet and greet, where uh, each of you can will, will have the opportunity to actually meet her. You know, we're going to miss uh, uh, the folks who were in charge over there, um, uh, you know, and all that they did for the city of Bloomington. But this becomes another opportunity to uh, start fresh and uh, really bring her into the community right at the very, very beginning. She's just a wonderful person. I think you're going to like her. And, you know, and, and keep in mind, I, I you know, um, uh, we, you know, I, I have a weekly meeting with uh, uh, a vice president uh, at Indiana University, and we talk about concerns. And, and uh, uh, of course, there's a lot of things that we, uh, whether it's streets or sidewalks or um, or uh, anything, there's all kinds of things that we uh, that we need to talk about uh, in regards to the city and and uh, the 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 campus. Um, so there is there is community. There's always communication between uh, um, our two parties. Thank you. Further questions for the Office of the Mayor's Budget? 
last call. Seeing none, we'll go to the public for comment on the mayor's budget, on the office of the mayor's budget. If you'd like to comment, please use the raise hand function in Zoom or type into the chat. Ms. Lacey, are there any apparent uh, speakers to the budget of the office of the mayor? But there are no takers this evening. Okay, last call for public comment on the budget of the office of the mayor. Please use the raise hand function in Zoom or type into the chat. Last call. Okay, and we'll come back to the council for debate. Is there any final comments on the mayor, mayor's budget? Councilmember Rallo, three minutes. Uh, thank favorite. you, Deputy Mayor, for your presentation. I just wanted to uh, say thank you for proceeding with the, uh, the, the leaf composting program. I think that that's a good approach, a pilot study. Uh, believe it or not, I, I think I first mentioned it in 2008, and I know that uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith's been talking about it for many, many years. So um, I, I think we're all appreciative if we can reduce reduce that um, expenditure and that uh, the amount of effort and energy that goes in, if we can uh, just simply have residents compost, uh, hopefully that'll catch on. Thanks. Thank you. Chair Volan, I believe you're. I believe you're muted. So sorry. Uh, <laughs> be glad when this is done. Uh, final comments on the budget of the office of the mayor. Going once. Going twice. Let's have a vote. We done by eleven. I'm going to count on the screen uh, going forward with starting with Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Scambaluri. Pass. Is that a pass or a yes? A pass. An a pass. Thank you. A Councilmember Flaherty. Yes. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes. Councilmember or President Sims. Yes. Councilmember Rallo. Pass. Councilmember Sandberg. Pass. Councilmember Rosenbarger. Yes. And I will pass. So I think I count five zero four. Did I get that right, Ms. Stoll? Ms. Stoll, did I get that right? Was it five zero four? Okay, very good. With that, our business is concluded and we're gonna be done with 15 seconds shy of 11 p.m. Uh, we reconvene tomorrow night. Who is uh, chairing tomorrow night? Council for Piedmont Smith will. We will see you tomorrow night at 6 p.m. for a night two of the four night budget week. Um, this meeting is adjourned. Or, yeah, we're adjourned. Good night, everyone.